Usually it says me. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the first Tuesday of the month, which means it's time for Straight Talk with Dr. Doug Lyle, where he answers your questions if you submit them in advance. All you have to do is go to chefaj.com, get on our mailing list, because every Saturday we send you the lineup for the week who the guests are, and you just respond to that email. However, not next month, because next month we're doing the Dugathon, and we'll talk more about that today. It's a three-hour monster interactive Q&A on Zoom because we're backlogged with questions. I never told the truth to Dr. Lyle when I said we went many months back. The truth is we're going many years back because I have questions from August of 2021 that we're trying to get to. That's right. what you are, Dr. Lyle. Good to see you. How are you doing? Fantastic, AJ. Thanks for thro throwing your brunch again. That was a, a great, uh, great food, great people. It's great to meet your doctor, your old boy. Yeah, so, so, you know, a lot of people watching will have watched the episode with the 100-year-old Dr. John Scharfenberg, and I could just talk all day about how great he is, but you actually met him. What did you think of this gentleman? Um, sweet, really nice man, super nice man. And um, and the he is obviously in really good health. Uh, you can you can tell, and he's uh, I, I can tell you my my first impressions were first of all he's a super nice guy, and the other thing is that he is uh, his life at at a hundred is completely worth living. In other words, that that is really something to see. So he is in as good a condition as you will. You would typically, if you're 80 years old and you're in that good of shape, you're fortunate. So that that is a that that is an extraordinary uh, uh, person physically and mentally. So that was a heck of a thing. Spent a lot of time on his uh, 26 acres uh, working these last couple of decades. So <laughs> what what a phys what physical condition and mental? It's great. You know, it's interesting, and I and, and I, I this wasn't the first question I was going to ask, but since I didn't know we were talking about Dr. Scharfenberg, because you had been asked about intermittent fasting before, and you've said, you know, don't do it, but he is attributing one of the secrets to his longevity, just like in the Adventist tradition, to not eating dinner, and he's mm -hmm. done it pretty much his whole life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all. Uh, yeah, that that's uh, whatever. P people People will attribute all kinds of things to all kinds of things. So uh, very often people that are exceptional are, do not know the reasons why they're exceptional. Okay? So they will, they will often make all kinds of misattributions. So there's little old, uh, I knew a little old lady that, that, that thought the reason why she was in good shape was she always had two cigarettes after dinner. Okay? She was just sure that was the reason why she was in good shape. So uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't put too much stock by, uh, by by someone's inferences about why they think they've been successful, uh, look at the overall pattern of behavior in their existence and see if we can make inferences from there. And I think he would also tell you, this guy's a very healthy eater. This guy's a very healthy eater. He's a guy that's exercised. You know, this is not a guy that did any smoking, drinking, drugs. You know what I mean? This is a, you can tell this guy is made out of some really healthy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I'd give up 10 years to be able to eat dinner because I, I just think it's like, I I, I guess I intermittent fast just because I choose to skip breakfast, not because of the health benefits, just because I'm busy and I'm not hungry. But dinner time, it's like, you know, what are you going to do if you don't eat dinner? It's like, it, it's ridiculous to, to <gasps> think that that's the reason for anything. The, um, the nature doesn't care about these kinds of timing things. And and uh, hu human nature has for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years uh, e eaten its main meal uh, when the men come home from hunting and the women have finished their gathering and they light a fire and they eat in the evening. So the, uh, the notion that somehow skipping dinner, obviously those calories are being made up at other meals. So, so now we start on, on this, on this uh merry-go-round search for like, well, maybe there's something special about not eating at dinner. And then maybe the, the, the fasting window is longer and there's autophagy process is longer. And therefore that's why the person's so healthy. It's like, really, let's do, let's do an experiment. Let's take, 
you know, a hundred, hundred people and have them do it that way. And I'll pick up a hundred people and have it do my, my way. And then we'll do it for 10 years. And we'll see if we can see any biological parameters that are any different. Like until you see any evidence for it, don't believe it. And there's, there's no, there's no logic to it. And any evidence that is supportive of it right now is really sketchy. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Cause that's the only time you can really do friends. Like nobody goes out for breakfast, you know? Anyway. Yeah. So Dr. Lyle, this question is from Bit. And she said you said something. And I actually watched the video to be sure that she said it accurately. She said, I uh, in a broadcast that you, meaning you, Dr. Lyle, did with Gustavo eight months ago called Rules and Expectations, you, Dr. Lyle, said only one in 10,000 people can exercise 45 minutes twice a day and eat salads, vegetables, and a couple of starches daily for the rest of their life to have a very low body fat and stay super svelte. Could you explain why you think so few can achieve and maintain this ideal? Mo I believe that is indeed what most of us are doing here and maybe even why most are on the McDougal plan. Yeah. Um, no, almost nobody can do it. What did I, how many did I say? Two in a thousand or you two said in a hundred? One in 10,000. Yeah, that's not probably, that's, that. I, I don't know if it's one in 10,000 or if it's one in a thousand. My, my point was it's rare, okay? This is not, this is not how human beings were designed to eat. And so it's not how human beings are, are going to be able to very effectively pull this off. So some people can do it. You know what I mean? You've got some rare people, as I've said many times, in order to, to do things at, at this level, that True North or Chef AJ or McDougal Maximum Weight Loss, this is, this is truly uh, very unusual eating patterns. And you've got to be highly motivated to do this. And you also have to have not just extremely high motivation, you have to have a very unusual personality. So, uh, so that, that's what you've hear, heard me say. You've heard me say that, you know, everybody could do it if that's all there was to eat. Then it'd be a thousand people out of a thousand, okay? Be 10,000 people out of 10,000. But if you give people other options and they can do things differently, now we've just dramatically reduced the, the statistical likelihood. So yeah, I think it's, I think people, almost all people that benefited, that I've ever seen benefit from the McDougal program have done it two thirds or three quarters. Okay, so that's what they do. And so there's nothing in the world wrong with that. They, you, you get a huge percentage of the benefit uh, from doing this. And the uh, and if a person's 50 pounds overweight, maybe they lose 30 of it. Okay, and so there they sit at 20 pounds overweight, a little frustrated with themselves, a little, little annoyed that they can't, quote, manage to get on and stay on the program perfectly. But the truth of the matter is the program is a very unnaturally lean diet. Uh, it can be done. Uh, you have to be highly motivated and an and, and usual personality and usually uh, disciplined to do this. Uh, some people can do it. I've met a few of them. Uh, they're, they're, they generally make their livings in this space. <laughs> in other words, they are highly committed individuals. I, I've met some more. I it's hard to know what the real numbers are. I mean, I can probably go back and I could probably find for you uh, in my wanderings 30, okay? But in my word at wanderings, I probably one way or another bumped into 30,000 people. So it may not be one in 10,000, but remember the only people I'm bumping into are already unusual or they wouldn't be super interested in food and going to conferences and listening and buying books and stuff like that. Who is that? That's not the typical human. It's nowhere near average. So we got to go, you know, right smack into Peoria, Illinois, i.e. where they always took the Broadway plays to see what middle America thinks and how they react. You got to go into right into Peoria and get 10,000 random people out of Peoria. <laughs> okay. Then we're going to find out, we're going to tell them all, listen, Everybody's overweight. Everybody's kind of worried about their health. Okay, this is what you need to do. And we're going to find out how many we get out of about 10,000. So not very many. So that I, I stand by that statement as being pretty close to accurate. Great. And you once talked about, did you call it the Auschwitz experiment, that if the motivation was high enough that everybody could do it? Yeah. 
you, you could get to the point where the motivation would be high enough that almost everybody could do it. There, there would be people with some great mental instabilities that couldn't do it, but the overwhelming and certainly children couldn't do it. But <clears throat> the Auschwitz experiment is, is if you go down the hallway at Auschwitz and they've got a bunch of healthy food down one corridor and they've got a bunch of really rich food of your favorite smorgasbord, you know, greasy stuff on the other. Um, and they told you, okay, if you go left, you know what I mean? Uh, and you eat the healthy food, you get to live till tomorrow. If you go to the right, you can eat it, but you know, then then you're you're going to be gone in by sundown. Okay, you know, people can make that choice, so they can they they can do that very easily. I mean, people would be rolling their eyes and 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 hitting their head and and signaling to each other their frustration about how much they wanted those sausages, but they wouldn't do it. OK, so the uh, it shows you uh, as we do that experiment in our mind's eye, we realize, oh, we can do this. Okay, We can do this. But what does this take? It takes a very acute high level of motivation to to beat the pleasure trap. If anything, uh, you know, was, Al and I have just talked about this over the, the, the last few years that that we have. Uh, realized that we underestimated the pleasure trap. So how ironic is that? <laughs> well, this we're making the entire case and the and the centerpiece of our career is about the pleasure trap. And we understand that this is absolutely what's standing in the way of between people being able to adopt a diet that would solve so many of their life's problems. And yet we see how difficult it is. And we wrote a whole book about it. It's difficulty and a bunch of reasoning and prescription for how to try to maneuver around the obstacles. So we did the very best we could to give a manual on how to follow this thing. And we figured it was worth writing because we figured that people would be quite successful. We've now discovered that, oh my goodness, it's quite a bit harder than we thought. So we will wind up with people that are um, very bright and very motivated. They're just not kooky enough. <laughs> okay. So we got every now and then we get a kooky one like AJ that just says, oh, well, if that's what you're going to give me in exchange for doing this, I'll definitely do it. <laughs> and they do it. And when we when we see that, that led us over the years to think, well, gosh, surely it can't be that rare. It's like, oh, turns out that it is. Wow. Well, my experience compared to you or Dr. Goldhammer is obviously very limited with the number of people I've worked with, but I've seen everybody do it where I don't see people succeed is they can't continue to do it. So they gain the weight. Yes. Yes. What you'll find is you'll find that people will do this for six weeks or six months. Um, you will see sometimes they can only do it for six days. But the point is, is that you will see a lot of people. We will see a high percentage of people because these are, these are unusual people to begin with. In other words, they're all, already way more interested in diet and health than the average person. And, and so they are, they're all, we're already looking at somebody that is not, not in the middle of the bell curve, just generally. Okay. So then when, once we go from there, then those, some of those people make significant efforts, not surprising. And then we find a high percentage of them really struggle. So Alan's been bragging uh, lately about his follow-up data uh, for he's got a group of people that have gone, went to True North and he followed them up for a year. And they've done well. They have, they've maintained a, a, a lot of their, a lot of the, the benefits that they've had, uh, most of the benefits. So we know they're doing a pretty good job on their diet. We also know that they're not aging. In other words, they're not doing, that. that's not what AJ's numbers look like. Okay, AJ's numbers look better than that. So. But the average number of the average of those 50 people or whatever it is that he sent through there, um, they've done quite well. And and he will acknowledge, like he, he tries to embarrass me because I say, no, they're not going to be able to pull that off. But I'm talking about if you were to do a, a randomized uh, control, random assignment to condition study on the average human being. So that's what I'm talking about. He's talking about people that opened up their wallets, got on a plane went to True North to do a water fast and then eat hygienic food afterwards. Well, who is that? It's not an average member of the population. 
So what's nice to see is that people that go through that, they are able to maintain a lot of the benefit, which is exactly what I've seen in the McDougall program. So, and I'm sure that AJ, if we, if we had exhaustive data on 10,000 of your people, we would see there's been a significant amount of success in that group, uh, but we would find that there's also people struggling now, a la the McDougall program, if the average person, you know, comes in 50 pounds overweight and a year later they're 20 pounds overweight, I consider that to be a very significant improvement and an awful, a big life-changing thing. Uh, they may be jumping up and down and calling me and saying, what about the last 20 pounds? And I'm like, well, you may not be enough of a kook, okay? Or there may be some things that you still need to learn. So we try to get that information out there important little details that we tried to keep working on but make no mistake that this is a this is you know one of the slipperiest challenges that you're ever going to see human beings try to take on yeah and there seems to be a mismatch between the body they say they want and what they're willing to do to achieve it <laughs> of course there is there there always is that's the that that that's the the, the nature of the uh, of the problem is that this is hard as a friend of mine said, yeah, this is hard, like digging coals hard. Yeah. I, remember, I was doing my calorie density presentation at Rancho La Puerta, and afterwards, this lady comes up to me and she goes, I want to be skinny, just like you, except I'm going to have to be able to have alcohol, cheese, you know, and on this list. And I'm like, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> good luck. There you anyway, go. That's funny. Well, we're going to switch gears and get out of the pleasure trap. And right. to the marriage trap, if it All is right. a trap. So here's an interesting question from August 2021. So sorry, CB, that it's taken so long, but we still have that. Actually, Joanna is the name. And she asks, since in the past, women didn't work outside the house most of the time, does that mean that a heterosexual relationship has more chances of being successful if the woman is a housewife or is it the other way around? Should women always have a means of income in order to be in a position of power for whatever the future brings? What is your view on this subject? Interesting question. Yeah, this is a um, <clears throat> sort of trying to see how things were in the past is a little, uh, this is a very fine question, but I want to start out by, by, um, being a little bit more precise about what we're talking about. People seem to have a picture in their mind of, of 1958. And they're like, that's how it was, right? So that's that's like our baseline reality. Uh, no, that's not the baseline reality. That the home for human beings, uh, there was no work outside the home in 1890. People were working on the farm. Okay, so there was, you know, 5,000 years ago, there is no working outside the home. So when you, uh, but there's been marriages for 10,000 years. So what are we talking about? So we're talking about modern recent America. So modern recent America, there was a time uh, when a lot of women stayed home. By the way, that, that period of time was when we were having a great many more children. So uh, there's a lot. So it was very typical for there to be three or four children in the house. So you can imagine uh, the supervision of a, a one-year-old, a three-year-old, a five-year-old, and a seven-year-old. It's like exactly how is the woman going to go get a job and manage that uh, in you know, 1963? Good luck. So, of course, the women were at home. So um, now... So the, now the question is about, about which marriages are might break up or not break up and you know what would be in things there? Would it be better if she's at home? Um, I, I don't think that that is a, that per se is an important variable uh, because the, the most important variable isn't the structure of the marriage, it's the inherent happiness between those two people and who they are. So that's, that, you know, People could have a great marriage and the woman stays at home. You could have a great marriage and the man stays at home. They uh, could have a great marriage, both of them go to work. Um, the, or the man goes to work. In other words, there's all, there's, 
the structure of that process is is probably not very well correlated. Uh, variant variances in the structure of that process is probably not highly predictive of how happy a marriage is. The um, the uh, marriages to this day, um, as best we can tell by looking at the the evidence, is that if the men think their wives are beautiful and the wives are proud of how much money the men make, those those two variables are actually our our most useful variables. Okay. Now, how important are they? Ah, they're only so important. Hold on one second, AJ. I have to take. A, I have to tell something. No worries. So, guys. The Dugathon yeah. is Sunday, July 16th from 2 to 5. Links to register in the chat in the show notes. I'm back. I was just having somebody back to me out there. Oh. Okay. Um, so anyway, without wandering around into territory that is, is going to be disturbing for people. the um, and, and by having people make emphasis that I'm not actually making. I'm just telling you, there are some, uh, there are some broad characteristics that have been discovered that are related to people staying together and being and actually being happy, happier. That's not a big deal. All right. So um, now to a final part of the question, which is that if you're a woman and you're at home with kids or thinking about having kids and might stay home with kids, should you should you be thinking about keeping yourself in a position of power um, and working, for example? The now, ideally, so we're, we're going to talk about, you know, you, you have to look at these things through uh, everybody's individual life situation. The, um, I recommend to young women that would like to have families that I tell them, listen, you should put yourself in a position with your education and knowledge and skills as much as you can before you get into a situation where you you are with with children, um, you you would ideally want to develop your knowledge and abilities and credentials to a point where if you were at home uh, with your children and not working, but it turns out that your marriage turns sideways and you're not happy, that you would be able to leave and support yourself and your children. Okay, you would like, i.e., that's what this person has heard me talk about being in a position of power. So if you are not in that position, um, you know, or in other words, some way, maybe you might have family help or whatever. In other words, you should run the scenario that if things go sideways, what am I gonna do? And you don't wanna be in a situation where things do go sideways and you are actually unable to leave a relationship that you would like to leave. You, that that doesn't just have to do with women and children. That has to do with people and anything. You don't want to be in a situation in some company town in 1944 in Pennsylvania digging coal, and you don't have enough money to get out of that town. So you have to buy from the company store at exorbitant rates. You are in a position of weakness, and you are not able to go make transactions and make the most of your life with other people. You are your options have been narrowed. You don't want that. You want your options to be as wide as possible. And if there's um, one, one major feature of, of, of a woman's life that, that alters her options significantly, it's going to be having children. And so in ideally, absolutely, you would want to have children in a situation where you're either independently wealthy, why not? <laughs> or you'd want to have a situation where you can earn a good living uh, and you aren't dependent upon the courts, you know, banging the gavel and giving you, you know, support or that your, your ex-husband may not be able to give for whatever reason, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So obviously a, a, a smart move on the chessboard of life is to, before you have children, uh, have the skills, credentials, knowledge, et cetera, that would make it possible for you to earn a decent living wage. Okay, that's all. The uh, that that's all I would be saying about that. So many people won't do that, and many people will still wind up in marriages that they could that are perfectly 
uh, functional and, and fine and their lives are good and they never they never face that. Uh, I still believe that that's a mistake. Even if you get away with it and you've made a wise, intelligent, mature choice and it's a stable choice and you have a great family, to, to be always in a situation where you are not sure that you could actually support yourself and be in that position of power with respect to that, that is a, uh, there will be some degree of psychological suffering as a result of not being in a stronger position. So um, obviously it, 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 that, that is why we would, I, I would encourage people that are you know, facing those kinds of dilemmas uh, in their life, go to the trouble if you can reasonably do so to get yourself into a position of power so that you are not having to uh, essentially suffer unnecessarily, that's all. Great, thank you. Next question comes all the way from Sydney, Australia from Narelle. And she says, Dr. Lyle, why is it as a society, we tend to find it more acceptable for a young woman to partner with a much older man than we do for a young man to partner with a much older woman? Well, um, there, there's many reasons for that. The, um, uh, th there is a, uh, there's some practical considerations. So the, we, we have a, a, a sort of a latent computation that goes on in human life, uh, whether we like it or not. And that is that women aren't going to be having children past about their 42nd birthday. That is so. The, uh, and, you know, I have a friend of mine that had in vitro at 48 and had triplets. Okay. So it's not like it's not possible, but let's, let's just look at reality. If you actually plot what's known as a fertility curve and you find out where all the children are being born, you're going to find out that almost no children are born on this earth when the mother is 42 or older. Okay. So the, we also know intuitively and as part part of our little latent calculus and looking at looking at, at people and their behavior, we we sort of know that the mating process has something to do with children. Okay? In other words, obviously the whole dynamics there are specifically uh, specifically and solely for the reproduction of DNA. Okay, forget about that. Just realize that we understand that there's this reproductive process that's in, involved in that 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 that's involved in the decision making that's involved. Like why why do you want to date that guy? Well, we have beautiful children. Okay, it's like okay, so you're you're sort of this this part of your innate calculus. So if you've got some 32 year old eligible bachelor, why is he? Uh, shacking up with a 45 year old female. It's like, huh, something about that just feels a little off. Okay. So, and it is off. In other words, gee, given his options, why would that be his calculus? Okay. We would believe that his calculus would be designed by nature to be headed to somebody who wouldn't have constraints on their reproductive capability. So, that's a strange pairing. Okay. It's a, it's a pairing that it sort of a part a, a very reasonable inference that is rattling around inside of the skulls of observers is is there something wrong with him? Okay, is there something wrong with this? I mean, they wouldn't ask the questions that I would ask. I would ask questions like, "Gee, I wonder if there's something a little bit off in his mating search image sensitivity. I wonder if there's a little genetic quirk in this guy." Okay. Did this run in his family? I think I've seen evidence in my life, AJ. I actually believe I have evidence where I've seen that. I think I actually, this, this question and this, co this commentary are running back through my mind that I actually believe somewhere in the 10,000 people that I have talked to in my career, I had a situation where this was happening and it had happened in, in the man's father as well. Okay, so... It's not, in other words, that relative insensitivity to that dynamics could be genetic. Of course it would be. And you could have other people, I've seen it the other way too, where, where um, I, I've, seen, I've seen, you know, um, 
I can recall, but I couldn't ever give you the specifics of, of you know, a 35 year old male being concerned about the fact that there's, that the woman is 28 and he's thinking that maybe he should be looking for somebody that's 22. And of course, my attitude is, what are you out of your mind? Okay. So what we see is that uh, when we look at mating preferences, uh, starting at age you know, 16, uh, and we look at worldwide evidence and look at survey research and look at what people do, we find a very interesting pattern. And that is that 16-year-old boys are really interested in 19-year-old girls. <laughs> okay? And you're like, oh, well, gee, they're interested in older women. You bet they are. Okay? A 19-year-old woman is more fertile than an 18-year-old woman. Just a little bit more mature. It's a little bit, she's a little bit uh, a better specimen for reproduction than an 18-year-old. Okay? So he's, so notice that he has no problem with older women, okay? I can remember the lady next door when I was 14. She's about 29. She's very attractive. I noticed her. <laughs> I was 14, okay? So now what happens? Now let's see what happens. Okay, well, then what we start to see happening is um, as people are in their early 20s, we start to see this process where it's common for them to be very, very similar in age about who people are choosing. And then we start to see an interesting dynamic where the males start to tend to be a little bit older, okay? And so now, and that, that will be a dynamic that we will see that will go on for a long time. The, uh, there's probably many reasons for that. So the male is attempting to acquire resources to lay them at the feet of the female uh, in order to make up for the difference of that that the that the female will be investing far more heavily in offspring than the male will be. And so therefore, in order to even out the investment process, the males have to be promising and attempting to deliver or show that they can deliver a high resource flow. Well, that takes time to develop the skills, knowledge, dominance hierarchy, ascension, et cetera. So a, a female at 22 looks at this situation and says, well, all things being equal, I'd rather have a 26-year-old than a 22-year-old, okay? So you start thinking, okay, so what's driving this isn't necessarily that males want, want younger females. It can be that younger females want older males because they are sitting on higher resource capabilities. So it's like, oh, so it isn't males that are call, calling the shots. And throughout, uh, throughout evolution, we will see that the development of, uh, sexual secondary characteristics that are exciting to females, these are being driven by female mate selection. It's not being driven by male mate selection. So the um, in, in our species, mate selection, i.e. preferences, we see out of both males and females. That's fairly atypical in the animal kingdom. Very, very rare, actually. So, um, uh, but in our species, the, the males have preferences and the females have preferences. So don't forget that, the, that when you see a discrepancy, this isn't culture. You're, you're looking at deep preferences of the, of, the, of the brains of these animals, that the females by nature are looking for evidence that the male has you know, more skill, more knowledge, has survived longer, and therefore may have better genes and better capability. So a 26-year-old is all things being equal a better specimen than a 22 year old, if you're a female looking at males, okay? So that's not going to be true the other direction because males aren't looking for females to protect and provide for them. So we don't need to be looking at that, at that evidence. So you're gonna find that these, these dynamics are part of human nature. And so therefore it's a little funny looking to see a 32 year old eligible bachelor hitting on a 45 year old female. It's like, ding, it's a sour note in the evolutionary landscape, okay? It is not a sour note for a 32 year old female to be looking at a 45 year old male. I mean, she's, you know, they generally don't. In other words, it's gonna turn out that they're, they're generally looking pretty close because a 45 year old male is all things being equal starting to deteriorate relative to a 40 year old male. So in other words, he's got more injuries. He's not as athletic. We can see that there's almost no professional athletes anywhere being paid anything that are 40 years old and over. 
okay? Uh, they have passed their prime and the, the, the female preferences are, are looking for that and they are doing their mate selection based on that. So 32 to 45, you don't typically see, okay? You see the 45 year old males would be very interested in making that deal, all things being equal, okay? But they don't get to. So anyway, so the long answer is, is that we can call it cultural because we see culturally transmitted evidence and discussion and behavior, but it's not cultural. It's actually biological, okay? In fact, biology causes culture. That's where culture comes from. Okay? That's why human beings behave the way they do, is that they have biological uh, calculations that are taking place. It's why in some cultures they like spicy food. You go to spicy food culture. Uh-uh. You people live near the equator where there's a lot of rotten food and you need to have spicy food that kills off the bacteria. You don't have spicy food in England. And so this is, uh, and, and, the, and the taste for that is going to uh, be genetic, uh, typically. So anyway, there's some, there's some things that we learn and there's some modifications to, to our, our persons based on you know, our, our life experiences, certainly. But uh, the culture that you see has picked up on, I mean, the culture is nothing other than echoing what I call shadows of forgotten ancestors. Your ancestors have been making very similar types of mating decisions for two million years, okay? And what you're seeing there in that difference between uh, male older, female older, yeah, the, the track marks in the snow are the 16-year-old boys are interested in 19-year-old girls. So it's not, that's, it's, it has to do with biology. And so that, that will flip around and, uh, and then you will see that other dynamic uh, for the rest of people's lives. Perfect. Thanks for explaining. This question is for, from Kim. What is Dr. Lyle's opinion of gratitude journaling? Can it actually benefit mental and emotional health? And can we train ourselves to maintain a more positive and optimistic outlook? And if so, how would we do that? Um, you can't train yourself to do things, right? So that that's a it's, a it's it's a fantastic question, by the way. You the, the person who's asking this uh, doesn't know that they've tripped over some of the most important fundamental questions of, of life. So uh, what you will have heard if you've been any, anywhere around self-help for the last 50 years or 75 years, you'll hear the concept that. We're going to try to train our mind. Okay. We're going to think these thoughts and we're going to try to think better thoughts. And then when we have the negative thoughts come in, we try to push those aside and try to replace those with these more positive thoughts. <clears throat> Very understandable, completely useless, does not work. Okay. Why? Uh, the reason is, is that the, the, the nature of, of psychology works as follows. That, that what you actually have every, every moment of your life is, uh, and the experience that you have is being derived from a cost-benefit analysis that is being uh, computing unconsciously. So that when you just try to decide what fingernail polish uh, that you're gonna put on, there's gonna be an awful lot of considerations in that. And many of the, many of the data associated with those uh, um, the vast majority of the data associated with that, uh, those decisions, is not ever going to be conscious. So you don't know anything consciously that you don't know unconsciously. In other words, the consciousness, you know, your conscious awareness is a subset of all of your unconscious uh, capabilities and knowledge. So there isn't something that's called the unconscious and then there's extra stuff on top called consciousness. This is a misunderstanding that, you know, it's super easy to, to see how that misunderstanding would work. Uh, everybody's made this mistake from Freud on forward. So the, what, what, the, what the mind is, is the mind is doing extraordinary unconscious calculations. These calculations are resulting in what you know as feelings, okay? So you have feelings based on super complicated unconscious calculations. Now, 
you might say, yeah, but I'm conscious of some of those things about those calculations. Uh, yeah, you are conscious of elements. So what your consciousness is, it's a summary of your unconscious process. It's a, it just takes the high points. So you, uh, if you were to say, well, you know, what, what do I like about this, you know, chili soup? You could actually identify some of the things that you like about the chili soup. And you could articulate the, what some of those things are, but that isn't all there is to it. There's chemical combinations in that soup, and there are flavors that you don't even have names for that you can't even describe. Okay. And you wouldn't know that you're picking up on textural cues that indicate, you know, how fresh or not fresh or how much the protein content is. Like there's all kinds of considerations that are actually going into your overall evaluation. All you have is a summary, and the summary is your feeling experience. Okay, so the um, uh, you know, so that that so your consciousness is actually what I call an echo of of your unconscious. It's a piece of it. It's telling you. It's kind of like if you had a very very huge dark library that had furniture all over it, and tables and book stacks all over the place. And then you had these lights up above that would put beams down, narrow beams down on it. So when you were looking at there, you could kind of tell it was a library and you could see some of the furniture. You could see some, you might see well enough to be able to walk through there and not bang your bang your knees into, into the desks. You can see pretty well, but you can't see even close to everything that's in there. And that is the nature of consciousness to unconsciousness. Now, Freud thought that the unconscious was full of evil, terrible things about people that we tried to stop consciousness from seeing it. Okay, He felt like we were motivated somehow for some bizarre reason to not know what's in the unconscious. That, that was just a massive mistake. That isn't how it is at all. In other words, the you cannot see what's in the unconscious because what's in the unconscious is super, super complicated calculations. It's estimated that the human mind uh, when it has bits of data uh, that it is considering in every second of its life, it is calculating with a trillion data bits. A trillion is a million million, okay? That's every second of your life. So you can recognize that you could never possibly identify consciously a trillion bits of data. You can't even you can't even remember a phone number with 10 digits in it. If I give you several seconds, you, you might not be able to read it back to me. That's 10 bits of data, for God's sakes. No, your unconscious mind is calculating phenomenal amounts of data. You say, well, where is it? Just go out and look at a landscape. Look at like a little river over there and pools and a barn and, and you know, trees and different colors. There's a phenomenal amount of data in that scene. Incredible amount of pixels that is actually involved in your calculation. But when you have, you have a summary of the scene and you were to talk to a friend of yours, you could look at the scene and not have a single word actually enter your consciousness. But yeah, a friend is on the, your cell phone and you're saying, well, what's it look like? You say, oh, it's beautiful. You gave him a summary, okay? You, had, you gave him a summary feeling of what took place as a result of all the computation. And then you could say, oh, there's trees and a lake. You can give him 30 or 50 words and give him some feel for it. But the actual amount of data that's in that scene that you're, that, that you're calculating is trillions of bits of data. You can tell because if you try to transfer it from, from one person to another with a video, with a video monitor, oh, it's gonna, we're gonna load a while on that thing. There's a lot of data in that scene. And that's two-dimensional, that's not three. No smells, none of the you know, nuances of it. Okay, so what are we getting at? What we're getting at is you don't tell the unconscious how to think and feel. You don't get to do that. You don't get to say, I'm gonna make myself have more gratitude, no. No, the only way you can have more gratitude is if your mind runs new data on evidence that there's reason to have more gratitude, okay? If that happens, if you actually have new evidence that you consider things in a different light and you have more gratitude, like for example, 
a friend of yours is helping you with a party, et cetera, et cetera. And she's working pretty hard. And then another person comes over and says, you know, do you know, Sarah, you know, has been really sick and laid up for the last four days. She just, she told me she just had to get over here and help because she promised. You already had some gratitude. And now you go over to her and you say, Sarah, what are you doing? You know, you didn't need to do this. Now you have more gratitude. Why? You have you have evidence that she made a greater sacrifice. Okay. So you might walk through Arlington National Cemetery one day and suddenly you're like, whoa, I've got a lot more gratitude to the people that came before me and, and lot left their lives on battlefields around the world for my freedom. And you feel more gratitude. You don't get to talk it into you to be a person with greater gratitude, but evidence could cause you to have more gratitude. And that evidence comes into your nervous system and is calculated in your unconscious and results in those feelings. So the only way to change is through new information that actually alters your very complicated cost-benefit analysis. You do not get to make changes because you would like the changes. So you cannot say, well, Dr. Lyle, I just want to get rid of these cravings, okay? How, you know, give me the trick for getting rid of those cravings. And I'd be like, well, there's no trick for getting rid of the cravings. Okay, the cravings are shadows of forgotten ancestors to try to help you make good decisions in environments of scarcity. Now, so if you eat that stuff regularly, your memory systems are going to tell you that it's likely to be in the environment and therefore it's going to generate a craving it's going to cause you to go look for it. Now, if you don't eat that food for 45 days and you don't smell it, it's nowhere in your environment, then after a while, your mind will say, well, it's not worth scanning our memory systems looking for that because we don't think it's in the environment. Therefore, it doesn't generate a craving. Okay. And you're like, well, that's not, you know, I'm looking for the trick because I can't keep myself out of it because I have the cravings. I'm like, well, I'm telling you, the only way that we're going to alter the cost benefit analysis inside the adapted mind is to actually take it out of the environment so that you don't. So for you go for long enough that the adapted mind says it's not worth the cost benefit analytics. To try to figure out where we're going to get that food because we're not going to get it. That's how we get rid of cravings. And that's the only way you get rid of it. Okay. So the, so yes, uh, gratitude journaling. It's like, okay, well, maybe if in your gratitude journaling there, you know, your you go through your memory systems and new data sort of re-arises and you reanalyze and you learn more and you it, you call up the computation as to why wh whether you should feel grateful, maybe, probably not. Okay. Probably the way for you to feel more grateful, there's no way to feel more grateful generally. There's a way to feel more grateful specifically. Grateful to whom? For what? Okay. And it will be in new information about how it is that you came to have a resource that you have, whether it's your health or your family or your job or your country, like whatever it is that you would feel more grateful about, it's going to be because of new information. One of the one of the things that probably all of us have felt. There have been days in my life, and there's probably been a hundred of them where I was mumbling about something I was irritated about, about somebody, about something, i.e., I'm not getting enough credit, I'm not getting enough money, I'm not getting enough affection, I'm not getting enough this, I'm not getting enough status, whatever the heck it was I was quietly bitching about, or even might have been openly bitching to somebody about. But probably it was me mumbling and feeling sorry for myself because of something. The IRS sent me a note and I owed him 1400 bucks and I didn't think I owed him. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. And then I see somebody in a wheelchair and I see them, you know, half falling down in that wheelchair and they're 33 years old and their, their big brother, big sister, or their mother's pushing them around a grocery store. What? And my bitching shuts off in a nanosecond. It's gone. Okay. And now I'm thinking, boy, Doug, you have absolutely nothing to complain about ever. You shut up. What that is, that's a 
a recalculation of fairness, okay? I actually personally spend quite a bit of my time feeling uh, in a good space of gratitude just because I feel like I know enough about history to know that human beings have, have had it really rough, okay? You know, 100 years ago, the average person is probably living to about 37. Uh, it's hard to believe, but it's true. The, um, uh, you go back a couple hundred years, probably 33, in other words, most people are dead by their 30th birthday almost everywhere in the world by, 19, by 1800. Okay, so you start realizing, wow, we're taking 77 as a given, for goodness sakes, in this country and, and in you know many places in the world today. So uh, people you know, starved. You know, they, were, they have rotten teeth. They have all kinds of problems throughout the ages. They live under tyrants. I have a government I'm not too happy about. There's a bunch of things that they do, but really compared to what people have lived under. So I walk around, I still complain, okay? I still have those third circuits go off. It isn't that they don't go off, but they are checked and balanced by a knowledge of history and an understanding of how good my life has been and how good it continues to be and how uh, grateful I ought to be for all of the knowledge and effort and, and courage and luck that has conspired over the, the millennia to have me be in this space at this time. So I don't generally feel too sorry for myself about anything. You know, can't get that date that I thought I should be able to have. <laughs> yeah. So the point is, is that, of course, we have disappointments and of course we have we have uh, things that are frustrating for us. However, the uh, gratitude, I think, is going to come from a, a, a more complete understanding of how fortunate we, we actually are relative to our, our other people that have lived now and then. Um, and keeping that in context rather than, than trying, to, trying to get ourselves to be more gratitude, being more knowledgeable about the human condition, I think that that can be helpful. Nice. Well, thank you. All right. All right. Here's a good question, I think. So this is from, from, from Natalie. And she says, if life's purpose is survival and reproduction, why is it that some couples just don't want kids? Is it in the female genes to not wanting to reproduce? Is it more due to finances, freedom, and how the world is set up nowadays? And how does evolution play a role here? Yeah. Okay. So one of the things that you have to understand about how evolution and motivation works is you have to understand that it, it uses what's what we will call a sub-goal structure. So <clears throat> notice, for example that if you smell tasty food, you are motivated to go get it. So when we really look at that, you wanna close the distance between yourself and that stimuli, okay? It's interesting that you, if you take something that, um, I don't know, a really tasty peach, for example, that you don't try to put it in your ear. It's like, hey, you know, the ear is capable of having preferences. And so why wouldn't we put it in our ear? Okay, why don't we put it in our eye? We actually like the look of it. No, we don't try to stuff it in our nose, even though it smells really good. No, it turns out that there's a very specific next step that has to do with our survival and reproductive success, which is to put it in our mouth. Okay. So you take put it in your mouth and you take a bite out of it. Okay. Now notice that, um, that when we do that, we want to chew it. It's like, well, when you're chewing it, you're not getting any benefit out of it. There's no calories that are not being absorbed. So there was no calories being absorbed when you saw the peach. There's no calories being absorbed when you smelled it. There's no calories when you put it in your mouth. There's no calories when you start chewing it. Okay. Notice that, and yet a very significant amount of the satisfaction, this is all about luring you into doing what? getting it into your stomach so that it can get into your small intestine so that it can actually, the materials can get into your bloodstream so that they can eventually get into the cells down in your little toe and into your pancreas and all over the place so that each of those things can get the fuel it needs to be able to do its function so that you can survive. 
oh, okay. But what, how is, how is that motivation structured? It's structured through sub goals. So when you're chewing, notice how frustrating it would be for somebody to say, hurry, hurry. And you have to swallow it before you chewed it up as much as you want. Interesting. There's a sub goal structure that you're not ready to swallow until you've done an idealized amount of chewing on that thing to pre-digest it, to do what? To more efficiently be able to digest it. And in doing so, there's little satisfaction circuits inside your mind that are built specifically with very, very close tolerances so that if you have to chew it a little early, you're not happy about it. I mean, so you have to swallow it a little quick. You're not happy about it, okay? Notice that uh, people say, oh, we'll chew your food more completely. Good, but really, what moron says that? Like, who, who knows? Who says? You have, you have a million forgotten ancestors that tried all different ways of chewing and evolution through different neural circuits of them with different preferences. And it turns out now they've triangulated on basically perfect. Okay. So now, so your what you want to do in your chewing is right on target with what you need to do in terms of the chewing in order to optimize your survival uh, utility out of that peach. Now, notice that if you do all that chewing, but you don't swallow, no, that's no good. Yeah, you chew it all up and chew it all up. And of course, I've had clients that did that because they're trying to not have not gain weight. So they don't want to actually eat the food. So they chew it and then they spit it out. Okay, well, notice how frustrating that is. You're not designed by nature to do that. You have a sub-goal mechanism that it, you don't get the full closure of satisfaction until you swallow, okay? And in fact, you can even feel sometimes that if something is halfway stuck down your esophagus, slowly moving, you still don't have the satisfaction. It's like, no, you want it all the way down the esophagus and get it into the stomach, and now we feel a more sense of completion. Interesting. So notice that when the calories from the peach um, go, you know, it moves from your stomach after some, some more digestive processes in the stomach, and then it moves through into the small intestine. And now for the first time, it starts being absorbed into the bloodstream. So now we finally have some calories being absorbed after all of that process. Notice when that's processing, you don't have any feelings at all. There's no satisfaction at all. You have, you have no, there is nothing. There is no reward. No, the reward was in the sub-goal structure to get it there. Okay. So now we start to understand why people, quote, might not want to have children and what does evolution have to say about this. The truth of the matter is, is that your motivation for mating and romance and sex, that is all a sub-goal structured process in order to fertilize an egg. Okay. Notice that when an egg is fertilized, a woman doesn't feel anything. There is no euphoric process when the, when the sperm breaks into an egg and gets inside there. And then even when it breaks into the egg, it hasn't actually caused the biological process of fertilization. That takes place when that sperm keeps moving and then meets the interior DNA inside that, inside that egg. And now we start to get sexual recombination and then even that's a process, it's not a moment. It's like, well, when is it? Well, I don't know, it's a whole process. But through that whole process, notice that there is no satisfaction at all. None, there's no feeling that's whatsoever. Okay, just as like there's no feelings when little molecules of, of, of uh, protein and carbohydrate and fat are being absorbed into your bloodstream from your small intestine. You're not feeling anything. No, all the feeling had to do with you doing the movements that it would take to get your body and that food in a place where you could get biological value out of it. It's the same exact thing with sex. So boy sees girl, girl sees boy, they meet, they flirt, they talk, they date, they do all kinds of stuff. And then eventually they sleep together and they have sex. And then the male has an orgasm, the female may or may not have an orgasm. But the bottom line is we have to have a male orgasm in order to get the, the little pieces of protein with the DNA molecule up to the egg, okay? That process is where all of that satisfaction, uh, psychological and physical satisfaction takes place. The actual process does not. 
So now we can see why human beings being the only species that ever knew the sex caused offspring, that they can actually say, well, wait a second, we don't want the last step in the process. So if we can mechanically block the very last step in the process, then we don't have to actually get done what the DNA is trying to get accomplished. We aren't designed to want to fertilize eggs or designed for sex and romance. That's what the sub goal satisfaction structure is. Okay, so that's how that all works. So that's why this is, you know, one of the rare places where we can do what I call beat your genes. Okay, so the uh, it's hard to do it. In other words, the genes are so good at structuring sub goals that they won't allow you to just chomp on a chocolate cake and then spit it out. No, you swallow it. You didn't get the satisfaction that we were looking for. Okay, so it, it or you can't just smell it. That isn't going to do it. So you can see that it's hard. The sub goal structure is extremely well engineered to see to it that animals do a really good job at increasing their biological success and that includes humans. So can we sometimes maneuver around it? Yeah, with great difficulty. Nice, one more or call it yeah. a night? One more, we'll do one okay. more. Okay, all right, it's so hard to choose. It's like Sophie's choice. Okay, this one is from Faith. And she says, Dr. Lyle, you have spoken on your work of closing the loop for tragic events that hold people back. And this resonated as a powerful tool. Can you talk a little bit more about how you do that and some examples of how this work would be great? Yeah, <clears throat> I, I, uh, I don't know about an example, maybe that's too long, but let me tell you in principle how this works. The, uh, if I have somebody that is cycling over and over about something, okay? The um, it could be a businessman right now that is cycling over and over. He can't get to sleep at night because he's thinking about some problem. He's thinking about that in a contract that he wrote, you know, that he he wrote four months ago. Uh, that he he looked went back and looked at it and he made made a mistake. And now he's trying to think through all the ramifications and whether or not he should go back to the person, start from scratch, raise the whole issue, and then create a big expensive mess because he can see the possibility for a problem. That would be an example of an open loop, okay? So uh, the mind is designed by nature to, it, it, actually, it actually invests time and energy in trying to solve problems to the extent that it runs a cost-benefit analysis that it believes that it's worth doing. So, people that, that believe, I mean, obviously, if people listen to me, and they have any idea about how it is that I think that the, the biological integration and sophistication of the analysis of the human mind that is now possible for us, uh, those, those of us that have studied it very, very carefully uh, for decades, this is a joke compared to where human beings were 75 years ago, okay? This is the equivalent of, in other words, the ability to understand how the human mind works today is at a vastly different level than it was in 1950. In the same way that semiconductor discussions about how computers work today is vastly more sophisticated than the computers of 1950. The, the lay public and most practicing psychologists and a lot of academics, they don't know this. Okay, so the, uh, they don't know just how sophisticated uh, the mind is and how it works. So they would not understand that when someone is ruminating about some nasty problem that happened in their past, they might think that, oh, you've been damaged, you've been traumatized, you're, you know, this is this terrible thing that has happened to you and, you know, poor you, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why you have this problem. That's why you've got one. No. No, all that's going on, if you're ruminating about something, the mind does not get damaged and then wrecks your existence in some convoluted, bizarre way. Not at all, okay? If you're ruminating about something, it is because the mind is running a trillion bit per second computation 
on the value of where it should put its attention. Okay. So you may be ruminating about some terrible thing, but if you are a rock climber and I take you out and we start to get up a, a rock cliff and we're 27 feet up there, up a sheer cliff, you're not thinking about any of those things that you were thinking about three hours ago in the therapist's office. That's out of your mind. Why? Because it is more important for you to focus on the rock climbing, otherwise you're going to die. Okay. So your mind will focus its attention where the highest profit is for your biological success. Now, if you keep returning to something over and over again, fairly often, years later or months later, in the case of my lawyer with the contract, four months later, what he wasn't, he hasn't been ruminating about it for four months. He's been ruminating about it for three weeks after he had a colleague point out to him, hey, you might have left yourself open for this error. You know what I mean? And he's like, oh my God, I didn't think of it. So now he has to ruminate because his mind says, whoa, that could be really expensive. That could be really embarrassing. That could be a big problem. And he's thinking, is it a big problem? What are the odds? So his job of his mind is to go do parameter estimations on what he ought to be doing about this. That is precisely what happens when someone has had a traumatic event and they're thinking about it 30 years later. Okay, what is going on there? What's going on is that there are there is something about the traumatic event that why was it a traumatic event? There was a loss. Okay, that's what the, that's what trauma is, some kind of a loss. So there's been a loss of some resource. It might be your left knee got blown off in an in accident in a war and you went over a landmine. Okay, and then that that's the problem. Okay, why are we thinking about that? We're thinking about it because the loss was very, very high. Okay, that was a big error. And so your brain should say, how did we make that mistake? Why did that happen? Is there any possible information that we can identify that would reduce the likelihood of me going over another one of those and blowing off my right leg? Okay. So the mind needs to do an extensive triage and an extensive analysis of what our vulnerabilities are if we've ever had a loss. Now, the Freudians will say, oh, well, there was a guy next door. So now all guys, you know, all guys named Ben, you know, you just have this trigger anxiety. No, you don't. You've met a hundred Bens and it never did anything. No, your brain is much, much more sophisticated than anybody has ever known. It is looking for specific variables and you know incredibly detailed data on what it is that it should be worried about. If it suspects that there is a way to identify it, but it can't find it. So it thinks there's a reason why you have the loss, but it cannot seem to identify it. If the loss was very high and there's no chance of it ever happening again, then what's going to happen is it will spin for a while. And if it can't find it, it'll let it go. That's what we find in all trauma research. So almost all traumas, almost all traumas. If they are very large losses, people will spin for about two years. And at the end of that time, you will find that they will rarely, they will only rarely occasionally think of the traumatic event. Okay. Of course, that would be true. The mind is in a superb machine that is designed by nature to actually be able to pick up a single photon of light in your eye. The tiniest little bit of chemical in your nose and you can identify, you could suddenly smell something, oh, I don't like the smell of that, okay? There's people and dogs that can walk by you and smell your breath and say, that person's got a cavity. Dennis can't find it, it's in there, okay? Mind is super sophisticated. It's not magical, but it's extraordinary. And if it suspects that there is something in there that we could learn that would reduce the odds of us having that trouble in the future, it's going to dedicate a, an appropriate amount of time and energy looking for that. The bigger the loss, the more surprising it was. We couldn't figure out why we were in that circumstances. We made, we've gone over that and we've seen done everything we can figure out that why that shouldn't have happened. That'll drive you crazy. Okay. If you can see obviously what the mistake it is that you made, 
you're like, whoa, I underestimated my vulnerability. I should have never been in that situation. That's not going to traumatize people for very long. They're going to beat themselves up for a while and they're going to say, dummy, don't do something stupid like that again. I'll never do that again. How many times have you heard that or heard yourself say? Quite a few. Okay. The open loop is a loop where the adapted mind believes it has sensed a pattern somewhere in the event characteristics. It thinks that it can identify it because it believes that it's seeing a pattern that is suspicious and it should be able to figure it out. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. You're like, I don't know what it is, but it's coming. Okay. And the mind can say, boy, just another half an hour. And I think we could solve it. And it's like, it spends that half an hour and it doesn't solve it, but it's close. And then it's like, gosh, I think I could solve it. Person goes on a vacation, goes into a cabin, starts to relax, slides in a hammock on a beach somewhere. And they're like, their mind turns to that trauma. And it's turning on it because it's like, man, I'm close. There's something about this. There's some pattern in there. I can't quite get it. And it returns because it feels like it's close. Okay. Obviously, people that are inherently more obsessive and detail oriented are going to have these things last longer. Okay. That's a personality characteristic that sits on top of that. Okay. This is how open loops work. This is how trauma has sequelae that could last for a long time in some people. Okay. My, uh, by using this understanding, uh, instead of some harebrained 19th century Freudian symbolic psychoanalytic absurdity, not bad for the 19th century. Hey, we're in the 21st century, people. You know, we're not a lot using abacuses. We're using computers now. We have way better understanding of how things work. I have used this understanding out of modern neuroscience to delicately go down through those memories of people and look for, see if I can see the pattern, okay? Can I see where I think the gold is that their mind is looking for? And I have to tell you, in a number of cases, I have found it, okay? And um, uh, they're, they're able, they, they're knowledge, super knowledgeable about that situation and they can report all kinds of details and they wind up being a very, very good guide for me. As I walk down through the situation, I put myself in their shoes and I ask all of the details about the surrounding situation, including their entire life context. And I walk my way down through that and I get to that and I see what they did and I see what happened. And we see why it is that the brain says, son of a bitch, how did we get to that decision? If we only had done this instead of that, we wouldn't have had that loss. Why did we make the decisions that we made? And very often I can say, I know why you made that decision. I would have made the same decision. This is why I made it. This is what you missed. Okay. And once we go down through that entire thing, chapter and verse, minute by minute, sometimes second by second, that if I can find the mistake that we can now identify, the person is like, got it, got it. It's like the moment in solving a math problem that's like, God, I understand. That all now makes perfect sense. Okay. And the relief can be tremendous. Okay. So uh, uh, the longest one I ever had was over 50 years. I had a person that had obsessed for 50 years about a tragic event. And uh, it took me, you know, about an hour and a half. And an hour and a half through that thing, I resolved it. Okay, so that was spectacular. And uh, that that's that's the that's one I remember. There have been, you know, 15 or 20 more. I, I can I can think of several, they start popping up in my head. The uh, but in all cases, nothing was symbolic, nothing was psychodynamic, nothing was any of that stuff. This was exactly what we would expect to find. The mind looking for informational treasure knowing that it needed it because it was vulnerable to a, a significant similar mistake that could take place in the future. Something bad happened once, it could happen again. It might've been rare as hell, 
but it doesn't matter. I'm vulnerable because I don't understand why that happened. Why did I make that mistake or why did that happen to me? Once you understand it, you feel immediately less vulnerable. Okay. And that is what the open loop is for. And that's how it works. Sounds great. Would that be in your next book at all? Any talk of no, that? No, I can't do that. I, that's too, too, too long of an explanation. So that's not going to be in the upcoming book. The upcoming book will explain, though, uh, in, in great detail, the, the nature of the motivational dynamics and the nature of change and what we can do and what we can't. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Dr. Lyle. We look forward to July 16th for the Dugathon. The regular session will not take place in July. So if you want to be with Dr. Lyle for three hours and hear his wisdom, please register with the link. And he'll be speaking September 17th in person in Sacramento with Dr. Goldhammer if you'd like to meet him in person. Always a pleasure, Dr. Lyle. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, AJ. I'll see oh you my soon. God. It's our pleasure. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back at 10 a.m. tomorrow. Kathy Hester's Kitchen. She'll be making whole food plant-based compliant ice creams for summer.